All right, we've got another holiday slash COVID repost. This time it's my 2018 conversation with James Pliggy, the vocalist of Harm's Way. And if I check my download statistics, this is consistently one of the most downloaded episodes of the podcast. Week after week, month after month, people are coming back to hear what James has to say, which makes sense since James is one of the most interesting and strange people I've ever met in my life. And uh, I think this is a, a, a pretty interesting conversation with James just kind of going down the rabbit hole with a lot of his musical interests and a lot of his thoughts about how the way people get into music have evolved over the years. And I think that, uh, you know, Harm's Way saw a little little time in the spotlight this summer with the Harm's Way Running Man meme, which if you guys haven't seen that, I will include a link in the show notes. There's some pretty excellent and hysterical iterations of, uh, of essentially, you know, people fighting invisible ninjas in a mosh pit and going nuts to some pretty excellent, excellently selected tunes. So check that out. Check that out if you haven't seen it. And new episodes will be back in January 2021. In the meantime, enjoy this conversation from 2018 with James Boogie. James, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> To the podcast. Um, tell me the story of you being a substitute teacher, first of all. I mean, there's uh, there's a lot of stories about being a substitute since it's been my uh, career for nine years now. <laughs> um, but uh, I guess one of the most memorable stories about um, the band being um, recognized or me being recognized from the band was um, like maybe like the third or fourth year there was like a group of kids that like clearly were like hardcore kids, you know? Yeah. And like one of the kids had a backtrack hoodie and like someone had like, it was like a title fight shirt and like some, there's like three or four kids. Yeah. And did you, did you like interact with them about that at all? <laughs> no, of course not. Well, so, cause I actually was a substitute teacher for probably like three months at one point. <laughs> yeah. And I definitely like encountered a kid who was like new metal and I tried to guide him a little bit. Like, I, was like, I was like, hey, man, like, what do you know about Morbid Angel or whatever? And he's like, I feel like I've heard of that, but I mean, I guess I'm not really sure. And so I was like, you should check out an album called Blessed Are the Sick. And I like wrote a bunch of stuff down for sure. him. But I take it that that's not your, yeah, I your mean, attitude. I mean, the thing is, is like if you're actually going to be a teacher, like you kind of have to separate your personal interests from your professional career. So... I'd never really wanted those things to coincide. However, being in a band that is somewhat popular, there's going to be people that recognize you no matter what you do. So, um, cause there, I mean, I remember when I was student teaching, there was a kid who would always wear like black metal shirts, like Burzum and like, you know, I think he had like Slayer and and just a bunch of other like bands where you'd be like, Oh, like, you know, I think one day I mentioned something. He had a death shirt on, and I was like, oh, you like this band? But, like, that's as far as I went with it. But Because, you know, you don't necessarily want to uh, start talking to a kid about Burzum. Yeah, that know? could go in the yeah, wrong direction. of course. Um, but anyway, so there's one time a bunch of kids are on the track, and, like, this was, like, the first time anyone had ever brought up Harm's Way to me as a as a teacher. And so they were they were – you know, because they were punk, they were obviously like lazy, like not doing the the, the kids who like wouldn't change for gym class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, none of them would change for for PE. Yeah, and uh, they like every time they would walk by, they would just yell harm's way. Like, like they asked me if I was in harm's way, I told them no. <laughs> and so every time they, so we were probably out there for an hour. They probably walked around the track maybe four times, and they would just yell harm's way for like, you know, basically half the track because you know they obviously wanted me to hear them and so that obviously that was funny um i had this is this what did you do did you did you react no, i mean for, honestly for like the first six years of me being a substitute like maybe four or five kids ever brought that up so yeah the only thing was is i would i would always deny it because like that was my that was my thing because i'm like i'm not talking about this to these kids because like I just, I would rather not, I'd rather not address it and have like them, it'd be a mystery basically than to like talk about it with them. But eventually 
like everybody found out, including teachers, because if you search my name, like I'm pretty sure like I'm the only pliggy in all of the United States. Yeah. So if you search my name, like it's I think only, I'm, I think I'm the only Neef. Yeah. Yeah. It's like only my extended family comes right. up and yeah. because of, you know, I guess I'm the most popular person in my family, if you will. Like my name is just, you know, every single headline on Google, all the photos are of me. Yeah. So like last year, this is pretty funny. So like I was in supervised study in like, is that like study hall? Yeah. Study hall or whatever. And, and this kid, they just started like, like four or five kids started playing the the record during study hall, like out loud. Yeah. And like, obviously they're not even supposed to be listening to music, but they were just like, you know, being shitheads. Yeah. And so like, I just like five kids are like basically playing rust. And I thought that was, it was funny, but I obviously got mad. Did you discipline them? Um, no. I mean, I just told them to turn it off. Okay. Um, I've been handed some demos a few times from kids that like, absolutely not. (laughs) Um, but the uh yeah it's pretty much i mean it's pretty much the extent of it but you know there's definitely like i teach at my old high school from time to time and uh all my old teachers found out that i was like in a band and it was kind of funny because i was expecting them to kind of be like oh, this is pretty weird and extreme but like totally had the opposite reaction yeah and, like everyone was like super like oh like this guy just isn't some quiet person that sits in the office. Like he actually does this stuff and he like travels the world. Sure. And so like every time I teach there, they're always like super positive. And, uh, actually like last May, a kid tried to interview me for the school paper about it. And I told them I didn't want to, you know, cause like obviously harm's way isn't necessarily a school appropriate band. Um, especially the older content, which is like, obviously like a little bit less serious, Yeah. but like obviously someone who doesn't know or understand yeah, you don't that. want someone to take those lyrics out of context and be like, yeah. oh, well. And I mean, people might do that already mm-hmm. if they don't understand it. But you know, <laughs> I remember the teachers were like, Hey, uh, you should do this interview. And I was like, well, you know, this is my personal life. I don't really want to mix with my professional life. Some of the content might not be appropriate. And they're like, oh, like, I understand. Like, and so that's pretty much it as far as, you know, so now obviously all the kids know I'm in a band and, you know, I just kind of, I just kind of had to eventually embrace it instead of denying it (laughs) all the time. Well, I I think when you first told me about that, you're like, yeah, this kid asked if I was in harm's way. I told him no. And he's like, well your name is James Pliggy and the singer of harm's way's name is James Pliggy and you look exactly like him and you're like, it's not me, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I also went for a while. I said I had a twin brother. And, yeah. Okay. And a lot of people believe that. Yeah. And it's like, well. Oh, well yeah. And like he goes by James, which is his middle name. And yeah, yeah. yeah I go. mean, you can make up shit. I just wanted to avoid talking about it, but it's too late for that now. Yeah. Now it's a, an everyday occurrence. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. So do the kids then think that that's cool? Because, I mean, I remember, like, in high school, you know, there was one of the gym teachers had, uh, like, briefly played for the Titans. And so that was like, wow, (laughs) this is so cool. And he actually had, he had some, like, fitness DVD that he was trying to sell. Right? So everyone was like, oh, Mr. Holbert. (laughs) This is so awesome. Yeah, you know, I think, I think kids are impressed but they also they have no understanding of it um i don't think like high school is a lot different from when you and i were in high school i think there isn't really like like a punk scene or a a metal scene yeah so like well i mean i think we grew up in like a really weird time sure that i think i took for granted but that that actually what we experienced was kind of insane yeah no i i mean it's I mean, you're talking about at my high school alone. I mean, there was 12 to 15 like punk kids, let alone not time, including kids who liked metal. 
But I think a lot of that had to do with just like the popular music that was in the nineties that led into the early two thousands. Yeah. You know, like grunge and I mean, do you think so though? New metal. Do you think that's why? I think so, honestly. Because But I mean I also think that our sort of whatever generation of near suburban Chicago <laughs> like weird miscreants ha- has uh like a, a unique, I don't know, like talent pool almost, right? Where if you look at it, it's like, okay, how many people in this overall group then went on to be in bands that had some at least moderate level of success? Sure. Right? No. Like that's like insane. Yeah, I mean it, it's weird too because I mean Obviously, like being successful as a musician is is a cool thing, but there's also I notice a lot less kids that are successful in sports too. So I don't know if it has to do with just like the creativity or the work ethic, or um, maybe the talent is just not as as strong as it was. Yeah. You well, know? I mean, because I, I think that something like that, you know, you get. Obviously, a certain amount of people have that creative ability. Sure. To be like, okay, I'm going to actually try to write something. And then I think if you also throw those people together at the right time in the right place, then, you know, they don't necessarily like compete with each other or always influence each other. But mm-hmm. I mean, it's very much like, okay, well, if these guys are doing this, I can also do this. Sure. And oh, they actually like got signed to a record label. So I know them. Like, we could probably do that. <laughs> Right. And then, yeah, yeah. you know, you, you have someone who's potentially like a few steps ahead of you in that process that mm-hmm. you can then, you know, maybe get it. I mean, I feel like people are not cool about giving advice really though. There's almost this like weird thing where it's like in music you're saying, uh, or not, just in general, not always, but at least in like that specific punk subgenre where it's like, so not cool to think of it as like being a career at all that people are almost sure. unwilling to like help you with the business aspect of things. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's tough because, you know, I think, you know, if you look at the early two thousands, you know, like fat records, punk was big. There was pop punk was big that still had like a crossover to like, you know, a lot of people who liked metal, you know, also liked fat records bands. Yeah. I mean, that's where I, that's how I got into like metal. I mean, was like essentially through, you know, ska and punk and then like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, that's basically when I was in junior high, like, I loved new metal, but like, I also liked good bands like Metallica, you know, I liked a lot of classic rock as my dad, but then like, um, if you remember Nick Donahue, of course, like he's the one who kind of started branching me towards punk and like, I mean, it's just interesting. Cause like the, there just isn't the interest level in music period that I noticed that was like around during our generation. Like, like dude, to, to have a, a store in Naperville that was strictly a punk and hardcore and like a little bit of metal, like just a small shop in downtown Naperville, it was called Busy Bee. Like yeah. that's where everyone went. I, I would make my mom like take me there because yeah. I didn't really live that close to it, but I would be like, mom, we need to go to Busy yeah, Bee. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like the fact that that existed is like, like that would never exist now. Like yeah. th- there's no way they would do nearly as, as much business aside from obviously, you know, the digital music, you know, obviously taking over, but you know, there's just not an interest in, in, in music at all. I mean, kids like the extent of music that kids know are, are mostly like rap artists and like popular, like R and B and hip hop. And yeah, there's not like that almost like crate digging mentality of like, no. all right, I'm going to like really dig in and be like, where did this band get influenced from? Where did this band get influenced yeah, from? And like, I mean, I think part of that has to do with just like, you'd think that people would know more about everything because of the internet and because they have access to all this information. But at the same time, I think they don't, I think that they kind of just feed off what's, what's given to them. Yeah. You Cause they, they don't, it, that's actually really interesting. I haven't thought of that where potentially these recommendation algorithms, which are actually like very impressive mm-hmm. might almost negatively impact that desire or that ability to search for stuff on your own. Sure. Yeah. I mean, cause like, Oh, like here's this thing that's been spoon fed to me that, you know, some guy who's trying to increase views or increase plays has given to you. Like, I think I really think that has a, a effect on at least high school kids and yeah, sure. you know, junior high kids. Well, I mean, I know for me, I don't know if I would have at least verbalized this this way, but I was somewhat competitive with like knowing about bands. 
Yeah. Right? And people, people will say that like, Oh, not necessarily in like the record store way of like, I'm going to look down on everyone. Sure. But it's like, if someone was listening to something and I didn't know about it, I was like, well, what the fuck I need to know about that. Yeah. No, and I would I, like I, actively be like, I want to know more bands than anyone else. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember, like, another place. Do you remember um, Record Breakers? Yeah, for sure. Um, so Nick Donahue and I would go there, like, twice a year. And, like, I would spend, like, the money I had saved from, like, my summer job, like, literally three or $400 worth of CDs Yeah, of, like, bands that Nick had recommended or bands I had read in liner notes. You know what I mean? Like, which, I, which obviously led to a lot of bad purchases, <laughs> you know? And like, cause like the first couple of years of high school, like Nick influenced like almost every band I listened to, which was a lot of like PC screamo and like weird punk shit. And eventually I was like, man, like this shit sucks. <laughs> like, like this is not the type of music I want to be a part of because at the same time I was like, you know, it was like the end of like being into like new metal and like getting more into you know, Youth of Today, Gorilla Biscuits, Minor Threat. Is that when he became Youth Crew James? Essentially, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's essentially what happened. Because I just, that was the type of music that I preferred. But I think a, a lot of that stems from, like, there was a jock mentality with those bands. You know, like, you know, 10 years later when you find out that 10 Yard Fight was like, mocking jocks none of them that were actually jocks yeah it's disappointing yeah <laughs> like for me as a person who you know literally lived sports and music was just like you know something i enjoyed and like but you know that was like essentially why i loved like four punch youths today you know and all those bands were like they wore Nikes. They wore Letterman jackets. Yeah. They were, you know, were Dude, fit. I mean, the first time I met you, you had some giant varsity jacket yeah, on. Yeah, still have it. I think that that was at, uh, it was at, what show was that? I don't remember. It was something at the fireside. And then you were there with Hofacker. Oh, uh, it must, maybe, maybe Bane. I don't know. But he's like, he's like, this is my friend, Youth Crew James. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just wearing this giant varsity jacket. I'm like, a accurate name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dude, yeah, it's a... It's funny. I mean, that's just, I guess when you look back on it, you know, like our generation just was into a lot of different things and there was a lot more things that seemed new to us. Whereas like now I just feel like there isn't a lot of new music coming out that kids in the mainstream know about. Yeah. Well, and I think that also that there's, again, you get, you get these like weird melting pot effects where we had something like the fireside bowl, which doesn't yeah. exist. And that, that again, looking back on that, I just took it for granted. I was like, Oh cool. Like there's this insane, like decrepit bowling alley that I get sick every time I go to, cause it's so full of mold, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like no joke. Like every time I'd get some like disease from yeah. going there, but I was just like, Oh yeah, well everyone has, you know, like every underground punk ska or metal band, like essentially playing every night and you can just go to yeah. the show as often as you want. Yeah. I mean, I guess like the most, I, or the smallest venue kids go to that I know of is like the Metro and that's like pretty few and far between. Uh, and like the only reason I know that is because a kid recognized a harm's way shirt that Kyle had on and they asked Kyle if they knew me. And they were just like kids from high school that I, I don't know what band they were seeing, like probably some shitty, like pop band or whatever that was playing there. Yeah. But so, I mean, yeah, there's just not the, the interest in music and like going to shows and concerts aside from like the big festivals. I think, I just think that that's, that's a, something of the past, honestly. Yeah. Well, and I think that there's also a difference too between, I mean, cause the internet was a huge part of me getting like weirdly obsessively into music, but it was a, it was essentially pre social media. Sure. Right. So a lot of it was on like message boards and, um, review sites and things like that, mm -hmm. which is more like going to the library, right? Yeah. Where you're like, okay, I'm going to like go on this playlist thread and I'm going to research everything <laughs> that this person who's into like weird jazz likes, because I just want to know what it is. And yeah. then you'd end up on some site you know, that has, here's the top 100 jazz records of all time. Yeah. Here's an angel fire. Uh, yeah. And you're like, okay, I guess yeah. I'm just going to like download each of these off of soul seek and listen to them yeah. and see what I think. 
and that that's, that's a, that's a different thing than, I mean, sort of like you were saying earlier, like, oh, I'm on social media and the algorithm is suggesting this, or I'm like listening on Spotify yeah. and the algorithm is suggesting this. Like, it's funny that like the internet was like obviously pretty new, like in the late nineties and early two thousands when we were getting into music and like you really had, I mean, the internet was straight up like it was like a wasteland. <laughs> like it, it, like there wasn't nearly as much that was there, but the stuff that was there was usually like poorly written or like a lot of the stuff was just kind of like a guy who created something on the, on a website oh, that, yeah. that that's how you found out about like, there wasn't like real professional websites that were created by people. It was more, you know, these, these things like, Hey, like check out my band and here's some Microsoft word text and, uh, and like, a, a zip file for you to download. You know? Dude, I, I remember like literally downloading MIDI files of songs. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. it was just like someone made a MIDI file of some <laughs> yeah. song I wanted to hear. So I would download the MIDI file <laughs> and it would just be like beep, 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 beep. And I was like, oh, I guess that's pretty good. And like maybe I'll see if I can find the real thing somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I guess, what was that called? Audio Galaxy? I don't remember it. Yeah, that was like before um, Soul Seek. And then obviously like Kaza. Oh, and yeah. Morpheus and like all those things that just like littered your computer with viruses. <laughs> basically. You had to like agree to all this stuff before. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, sounds good. But uh yeah, it's who knows, man, the the kids these days. They uh they they, they have it they have it too easy, man. Yeah. We had to slog through fifty six K download yeah, speed yeah. connections to like your one song would be done by the end of the day if you were lucky. Yeah. You know, but yeah. now you can download fucking 45 albums in like an hour. Yeah. And, and but I, I wonder though why, I mean, do you think there are people who have that same sort of like collector's mindset or like whatever cataloging mindset who are like, okay, like I have all this stuff and I'm going to go access it? I really don't think so. Only because. I mean, think about all the things that like, you know, when you were younger, you collected like action figures and you collected, you know, maybe baseball cards or you collected, you know, Pokemon stuff or whatever, like pogs. Yeah. Like, dude, <laughs> that like that interest in like collecting is just not there anymore. And so, like, I just mean, like, we wanted a lot of these things because like, Oh, we were interested in this. We're going to like buy all this stuff that's related to this and we're, or we're going to collect like shirts or CDs. And like, dude, that's a thing of like our generation because I mean, dude, how many kids use eBay you think that are under the age of 20? I have no idea. Like literally probably I would say 5%. Whereas like, we're still like, Oh, we want this nostalgic, like, thing that we always yeah, wanted want this carnivore shirt. Yeah, yeah yeah but like i don't i just don't think kids care about having that because you can go on apple music search for you know the the new future record and it's there and that's it like they don't you know they don't stare too far away from from those like things that are mainstream if you will yeah that's interesting i mean i wonder also if that will be something that people grow into. I don't know though. I was like, I was probably the most obsessive about that stuff from probably age like 18 to 23. Yeah, no, I, right. That was probably the peak time of like, you know, borderline autistic like, <laughs> yeah. collecting behavior of like, Oh, I just need to like yeah. check all this stuff out. Of course. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't, I don't think if it, if it hasn't happened by high school, I would doubt that that's something that's you know, if music, not saying it can't be, but if music isn't a large part of your life, you know, while you're in high school, I think then it's really not going to have the impact that, you know, music had on you or I. Yeah. Well, and I, something that I think about is, I mean, I think that our generation, at least in this scene of, you know, again, like near West suburban <laughs> Chicago metal and punk was kind of the last one to really produce a bunch of bands. 
Yeah. Right. I mean, like, and that's really interesting because I mean, I think for us, it was very easy to look up to like he who corrupts or Kung Fu Rick or something like that, where it's like, okay, sure. cool. These like really cool guys are like 25 years old and whoa, like I can hang out with them and they like can <laughs> tell me bands to check out or sure. whatever. You know what I mean? And then, um, I, I don't think that that happened for us, right. That we didn't have like a younger generation that after us was creating bands and, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, if you want to talk about like Chicago hardcore, you know, or metal, like that being a, a problem, I mean, I think that's why the, the scene of people is kind of like drifted away is because everyone is getting older. And, you know, as before, like the older guys kind of passed it on and they kind of, they didn't necessarily move on, but they, you know, it wasn't as big a part of their life as it once was. Whereas now, there, like there is no one to pass it on to. You know, there's no, there's no kids who are setting up shows. The guy who set up shows, you know, Shane, when we yeah. were in Still doing high it. school yeah. is, is the one setting up the shows, yeah. you know? And like, eventually that's, you know, going to be problematic because it's just going to be gone unless someone else takes over at a certain point, you know, obviously not all, not everybody who is in bands when we, you know, 12 years ago is still going to be involved in another right. 10 years. You know what I mean? Obviously, like, Week of Nachos broke up. You know, Drew is a, a part of a lot of bands. You know, obviously, Chris and Bo, they were a part of a lot of bands. And, like, it's either eventually you're going to be in a band that's your career or you're going to just be in a few bands and it's not going to be or it can't really be the focal point of your life because you're not going to have time. Yeah. You know? So... I mean, it's I don't know. I think, I think people can still just prioritize it though. Right. I mean, it, it gets sure. harder, obviously the more life responsibilities you have, but yeah, no, I mean, I don't mean like you can't be in bands. I just mean, as far as like the interest level when you're younger is obviously much greater because you have the time yeah. to dedicate, you know? Well, and, and then there's, there's also, I mean, there's no opportunity cost to you just being like, Oh fuck it. I'm going to go on tour for two weeks. Like sure. that just seems like a cool thing to do. Whereas now it's like, okay, if I were to just decide to go on tour for two weeks, that means I'm not doing all this stuff. Right. Like, yeah, I mean, of course my business is maybe not going to struggle, but like, okay, like I have all the stuff I should be doing for that. <laughs> like, you know, my girlfriend will get mad at me. Like, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll just be substituting other things. Whereas when you're younger, there's, there's really nothing that you're substituting. No. You'd yeah. Be doing. And, you know, I, I think that goes with, like, going to shows, too. Like, when we were 18 through 24, I mean, you'd go to two shows a week or three shows a yeah, week easy. if you could, you yeah. know? But now, like, aside from playing, like, on tour, I mean, I'm lucky if I go to one show every two months. Yeah. You know, it's just that's the way things things go. I mean, obviously, I could prioritize that, but when you spend most of your life doing that, I mean, that yeah. isn't going to be a priority outside of. Yeah. I mean, and for me, I don't know if it's necessarily being jaded exactly, but it's like when you've played so many shows or been like on the other side of that so many uh -huh. times, I think some of the like magic has gone from it. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, you know, cause before it's like, holy, like, you know, you're, you're excited to see this band and you know, you, you there are these like godlike figures to you and you, <laughs> you know, whatever. But then after you've met enough people and sort of seen that like, okay, like these guys are all just idiots or like, yeah, yeah they're cool or whatever. And you, I mean, once you sort of seen how the sausage is made enough times, it's like, eh. Yeah, know. no, of course. I mean, I, <laughs> it's funny cause like, obviously there's bands I've played with that, you know, I've been like kind of starstruck, if you will. But at the same so time, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, obviously Max has been yeah. a huge influence on all of Harm's Way's material for the last 10 years. And that's like, obviously, you know, when I someone... I mean, he, he may have invented that single string groovy riff. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean Soulfly is not a very good band. <laughs> Um, I never really liked Soulfly that much aside from forcing myself to try, <laughs> try and get into them. But, you know, if you look at the impact he had on metal and like, I mean, Chaos AD is a, is a record, you know, that we constantly revisit to find, you know, inspiration for writing. And then like you meet the guy and like, obviously he's, he's a really cool dude when we met him, you know, but they're old you know, that these guys like, like to expect someone who's, you know, in their fifties to 
have the same <laughs> like energy and the same intensity that they had when they were like 25, you know, potentially a whole lifetime ago, you know, <laughs> like that's just unrealistic. But at the same time, I think the problem is, is you have this expectation when you meet those people that you're, they're going to, you're going to be like this uh, figure that, you know, is untouchable, but it's just, that's just not the case at all. Right. You know, it's, it's just like an everyday person that now they're old and, you know, talking to them, you know, it's just like, all right, well, that's depressing. And <laughs> what about meeting Billy Milano? That was a very brief, <laughs> very brief uh, encounter, but it was funny because I didn't even recognize him. Because last time I saw him, he was in MOD. They played, I think Madball played in the cro Do you remember that show? Was I there? I don't know. I think so, but yeah. sounds like something. But I'll like they they came out on stage, played one song, and Billy Milano was like, ah, "Not feeling it tonight." Sorry, <laughs> he got off stage, <laughs> and like I remember him being like five hundred pounds. <laughs> like maybe that was just like a, a picture in my head that that wasn't actual reality. So when I saw him, I was like, "Yo, that can't be him." But he like. <laughs> I don't know. He seemed cool. He, he seemed just like I would expect Billy Milano to be at, you know, whatever age he is, 55 probably at this point. Yeah. You know, but. I mean, didn't he just like say a bunch of stuff to you? And like, I mean, he, I, I mean basically he came up to our group. We were waiting for Soulfly to load out. Um, and basically like he was like, Hey, let me see some IDs over here. <laughs> and we're like, yo, who the fuck is this guy? Like, everyone looked at each other like, yo, what the fuck? And then like, <laughs> and then he, he was like, oh, just messing with you. <laughs> and he was like, you guys ever hear of SOD? And like, Chris was like, yeah, fuck yeah, man. And he was like, oh, I used, I used to sing for that band. I sing for MOD now. And like, I, but I'm thinking like, no, you fucking didn't. <laughs> Like, this is, like, you know, I was like, there's no way that this is Billy Milano. Like, it's not possible. And then Chris was like, dude, why didn't you say anything? Because he basically just pulled out a cigar that was, like, a foot long, <laughs> put it in his mouth, and drove off in his Subaru. <laughs> like, he said some other funny thing. I can't remember what it was. It was something like, he's like, yeah, I just listen to Peter Gabriel now. <laughs> See ya. Like it was like literally a, like a 30 second conversation, but in retrospect, uh, it would have been funny to get a picture with him. You know, you probably should have. Yeah, you definitely should have. Then you could have made that a harm's way shirt. We should have. Yeah. All of the legends, you know, that would actually be a really good idea. Yeah. I'm sure it would go over real well in the PC culture probably. of uh, you modern get, times. You get banned from Europe again. Yeah. I'm already going to get banned from Europe. <laughs> Simply for even saying the word Burzum. Yeah, yeah. On this podcast, I, I, yeah. Harm's Way will never play Europe again. I, I'm pretty sure Hate Force is banned from Europe and we never even played a, a show. That's probably in true. Europe, just based upon our name. Our, yeah. Our, well, Like Rats is going to Europe later this year, so maybe we're banned as soon as that Hate Force LP comes sure, out. Sure, yeah. We'll find out they'll what take, happens. They'll take everything super serious. Yeah. As they do. We'll find out what happens. <laughs> um so let's talk about harm's way new record yeah it's good i think it's obviously our our best material to date but obviously that's coming from someone who was a part of creating it however you know i will i i personally thought rust was a very cool record but i like the direction of post-human a lot better i think it's a lot heavier there's a lot uh, faster parts I think like the comparison to Godflesh is actually the most accurate um, it's ever been because a lot of people have been throwing that around for a long time. Sure. Well, I mean, I think um, anything with like an industrial sounding part with like a, <laughs> a guy like sort of shout talking is like, oh, Godflesh. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, but then I guess on this record, we actually have full electronic song. You know, we have some uh, songs that, 
kind of deviate from the normal harm's way uh, songwriting, um, but in a in a good way, which which is hard to do sometimes, is to make something creative and different that isn't going to be completely different uh, uh, musically. You know what I mean? But uh, but yeah, I'm really excited about that record. It's it's always weird when you record something. And like you basically been working on something for like two years and then you finally record it, which is we recorded in August and it was done in like September and then you have to wait another six months. But that's still like relatively quick turnaround for something like that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, a lot of bands will have their record like sat on for like a year. Yeah. Because originally we wanted the record out like even before 2017 was over. But obviously that was less realistic um, with recording in August. So, um, yeah, I mean, Metal Blade basically was like, yeah, you need to have the record done, mixed and mastered by this time. And then we like turned it in like three weeks after that. And we were like, well, we expect it to to still be out at the same time. But because originally I think it was supposed to be out like January 20th. So we had to push it back a little bit, but it ends up working out because our tour is starts February 17th and the record comes out February 9th. So there'll be Perfect. like 10 days, eight days Perfect. to listen to it before we go on. So tour. everyone can know the words. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What songs are you going to play from it? Um, I think we haven't fully decided, but, um, at least the two new ones that we've released, which were, uh, human carrying capacity and call my name. So the first song and then what number is call my name? Uh, number six. Okay. Um, and then we also will play number five, which is become a machine. Yeah. Um, and probably one more dude play track three track three. It's the best song. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I like that song quite a bit as well, Yeah. but I also don't want to play a bunch of songs. Nobody has a chance, had a chance to listen to yet. Sure. So at least those three songs, because those will all be released before um, we go on tour. Yeah. So, so I want to ask you about the transitions that you guys <laughs> write, because they're really good, and I think that that's actually like something that's super, uh, I guess, underappreciated. Um, that I don't think people who aren't musicians necessarily notice. Sure. But that is like one of the most important things for like a heavy band is actually having like good and clever transitions between parts because that's the stuff that like makes something like exciting or hit hard. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, people won't necessarily know why they're so excited that like a part is happening, but it's like, well, it's because they teased it over here and they played a variation of it here and then it actually happened. So yeah, you yeah. Like kind of felt it coming. So, I mean, essentially the funny part is, is that's actually one of the hardest things for us to do is to create solid transitions. But at the same time, because it's hard for us to do, I think we spend a long, a long time, like getting transitions. Right. I mean, I think that's basically the reason the record took so long because obviously like writing riffs, I mean, obviously that's complicated, but learning how to connect the riffs properly and making the song flow in, in a way in which it feels like a complete and each part, you know, is consistent, um, is, is, is the most difficult. So I think, I mean, Chris is, Chris is really good at coming up with transitions. Um, he's probably the one that like, you know, there's a lot of times where we'll have like some shitty transition and he'll be like, yeah, we, this thing sucks. Like, and I think like having him be so critical of transitions is helped us like, all right, no, nope, we'll scrap this. We'll scrap that. Like we got to change this transition. And like specifically this record, like we've, I mean, a lot of these, some of these songs are like over two years old. So it's like, we basically went back and had to revise at least, you know, eight of the songs that we made just because like, we didn't like the transitions in, in a lot of the parts, you know, cause a lot of the riffs stayed the same. But yeah, like when you listen to something over and over and you're just not happy with the way the song flows, like it all comes down to how each part flows in, into one another. So that's basically Chris, Chris and, and our newest guitarist, Nick, for this record really helped with creating the transition. Transition maestros. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, something I think is interesting also, uh, 
at least from, you know, I mean, hate for stuff is that, I mean, you'll be like super critical of a part in a way <laughs> yeah. it's like very forward, which I think is awesome. Right, because I think in a lot of bands, it's not necessarily like that. Um, I know in Like Rats, it's not like that, but the writing dynamic is different there. Sure. That's kind of more of like a, I don't know, like a benevolent dictatorship. Yeah. yeah. Where it's sort of like, okay, I write the song and I bring it and like, I'll listen to your idea, but like, it's my <laughs> song and I'm going to do what I want. Yeah, so like, course. if you say something, I'll be like, oh, that might actually be a good idea. But sometimes I'm like, no, like this part goes like this. But it seems like Harm's Way is not necessarily like that. It's a little bit more collaborative. Yeah, I mean, I think as time has gone on, um, I mean, basically, since No Gods, No Masters, I wrote a lot of riffs for Harm's Way, and I became more of a, I guess, more involved in the actual songwriting Cause before that it was, it was caution, like pretty much caution wrote a lot of the stuff. Dude, caution is like the most prolific musician. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, he's literally probably, I mean, there's probably, we've only heard probably 10% of the songs <laughs> yeah. that he, that, that dude's created, which is, which is awesome. But how I, you know, I love the dude to death, but he has a specific way of writing songs and you know, a lot of the harm's way songs that are older had a similar formula. And once we hit like no guys, no masters, ironically, I wrote, I think every song in that record. And it was at a time period where like, we kind of were unsure if we we're going to still do the band and, you know, essentially like Hofacker and caution quit cause they didn't like the songs. Yeah. And it, but it's just funny. It was too metal. I don't even know why necessarily they just did, weren't into it. Yeah. And it's just funny that that's kind of, the transition of us becoming more popular of a band was like that record. Dude, caution was holding you. Back. <laughs> yeah. He was, he, he was holding us back the whole time. Yeah. No, but you know, on a serious note, it's just, like, I learned to become critical because I hate listening to something that I'm a part of. And like, every time you listen to it, you're like, man, like yeah. this part. But that, I mean, I feel like that's almost unavoidable though. I know that every time I listen to like a like rats thing, there'll be something where I'm like, well, I know that was played a little wrong or like, I know that we like sort of flubbed the click track there and like I can hear it and I'm annoyed by it. And yeah, no, I mean, I, it's literally impossible to make things perfect in yeah. that regard. You know what I mean? Like there's things that you would notice that, uh, about the songs that you wrote that nobody ever would even think about. But I think, at the same time, like, you know, little things like that. I mean, every yeah, I mean, single you recording. Just, yeah, it's just like, whatever. It's, like, it's part of it. It's not a big deal. But like, yeah. if the actual riff is bad. Yeah, sure. Or like, the way I sang a part was weak. Like, that really bothers me. So, like, during the writing process, I just learned, like, hey, like, it's better to be vocal about not liking a part without criticizing the person who wrote it. Cause I think that's a big problem is like, if you're constantly like going at somebody who's writing riffs, trying to do something positive, that can be problematic too, because then you get an argument, sure. <laughs> a band argument, but, <laughs> but I have a band meeting. Yeah. Yeah. But I think one thing that harm's way is really cool about is always trying stuff like, and I try to always at least entertain the idea before I shut it down even if I don't like the riff, because as you know, as a person who is not very good at guitar, like I might have an idea that's played or executed very poorly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and you know, so it's funny because when I first started showing the band riffs that I wrote, like they literally like were looking at me like, yo, <laughs> like what, what the fuck are you doing? Like, and like eventually they became to trust me that like I could orchestrate, you know, the transition that I wanted and, you know, the chorus that I wanted and to make it a full song. And when played, you know, it would make sense. It would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I've gotten better at guitar over time. So it's a little bit easier to, you know, write riffs that, okay, they know exactly what I'm talking about. But at, at the beginning, like around no guys, no, no masters era, like I literally, knew how to play power chord because it was in drop tuning and 
I would hit single strings to show everything. Yeah. Cause like I played bass. So, you know, writing songs on bass is not really an effective way right. to write songs. So, yeah. And, and, and just, just to clarify, cause this is super funny is that <laughs> essentially James will be able to write songs, but not be able to play them, which yeah. is incredible. Right. So actually hate force is very funny because you and drew would both write riffs that you couldn't play. So you guys would be like, all right, like, here's how this goes. And then you'd be like trying to play something. And I'd be like, okay, do you mean <laughs> this? And you're like, no, more like this. Like, okay, hold on. Do you mean this? Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, it, obviously, because I know you've experienced this many times. It's like, there's people who can play guitars. They can't write music at all. Like, they might be like an actual. Oh, for sure. A musician that can execute. Yeah, like 95% of guitar teachers yeah. in the world. Yeah. But like when it comes to writing music, like they, they can't do it. So I think like, obviously it would be, you know, the best case scenario if I was like excellent at guitar, but like me being okay at guitar, being able to play power chords and like, I mean, really the things I struggle with are like, you know, things where I have to like extend my fingers, like, you know, yeah. a few bars down or using like, you know, the fourth string and the first string at the same time, like making those weird I guess guitar noises and things like that. Like I, I have a hard time doing that. Sure. But I mean, I guess, I guess if I, if I'm really thinking about this, it's probably somewhat similar to when I'm like telling a drummer to play something, right? Yeah, Cause it's course. like, I can play drums moderately, right? At some point in my life, I was practicing <laughs> drums regularly and I was like capable of playing drums for a band, but I was never good. I was yeah, never a good drummer, but I mean, I'll know exactly a fill that I want played. Yeah. Yeah. And I know enough to be like, Hey, do like this. So, and I, and I know what I'm trying to get out of that specific fill so I can yeah. make it happen. No, of course. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know how to play drums at all, but you know, I can tell Chris like, Hey, this is the type of drumming and that, I guess that's where a lot of the not ripoffs come necessarily, but with influences where it's like, this is the song I had in mind. This is a style of drumming I had in mind. You know, here is the riff that is similar to this. Cause like every single piece of music that's good is not unique in yeah. my opinion. Like every good piece of music <laughs> has an influence of a band and they not steel riffs, but the riffs are influenced sure. by other songs of good bands. Like, I mean, even from, you know, if you look at Metallica, like obviously a lot of the stuff's influenced by Black Sabbath or, yeah. you know, Diamond Head. Yeah. Or, you know, Merciful Fate. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So like, you know, same thing with Slayer, but like, obviously that, that cycle continues, you know, <laughs> then people base, you know, things off Metallica and Slayer and, you know, then you get Pantera and then, you know, et cetera, yeah. you know, but I just think like bands who try to be unique and try to like come up with their own style, like they always suck. <laughs> like they, they, they're not, they're never good. <laughs> so like I'll stand by that. And <laughs> that's why some of our wrists may or may not sound like bands that we like. Yeah. Well, uh, on the new record, you ripped off a Triptychon riff <laughs> that you've already ripped off previously. <laughs> yeah. I mean, See, but the thing is, like, <laughs> Tom G did not invent the open chug. It's not even an open chug riff. It's the one that's like, yeah, you know, I I know what part you're right. talking yeah, about. It's but that like, single string part. But like, the only reason why <laughs> it's people would say that it's a Triptychon ripoff is because it is. He's a few. Well, yes, but he's like one of the few people that did it that wasn't like considered cheesy or new metal. Like, like if you listen to like the last, yeah. um, well, Celtic frost record, I, I, when that came out, I was furious. Like monotheist. I was so mad. <laughs> it's, I was so mad. Cause I was like, this is the stupidest, cheesiest new metal record. <laughs> and I was like, just yeah. unbelievably upset. And then you, then you actually and then I gained learned, some sense. And that then I learned that it's, it's actually incredible. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I mean, uh, some of that was just expectations where I was like, this is going to be another two megatherian. Like this is going to rule. <laughs> and then it's like, comes in with some like kid rock riff. And I'm like, no, what's happening? <laughs> what's funny is that's my favorite Celtic frost record. <laughs> yeah. And I guess, I don't know if that makes me a poser, but I, I fucking, that record to me is fucking great. That's I mean, actually, it's unbelievably heavy. 
that that record is like pretty much why Blinded exists. We ripped off a sure. lot of stuff from. Yeah, from that, that makes record. sense. That makes sense. I mean, I yeah. think uh, that Aus Abysme song is one of the like top five heaviest songs of all time. Is that the one? It's like, dun 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 dun. No, that's that? also very heavy. That's oh. on the. That's a Triptychon song. That's on the Shatter EP. No, no, no. You're thinking of a different song. Uh-uh. There's, there's like you know the first song I'm out there starts of like, bow now 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 now. Like, yeah. there's a part in that song where. I, I'm not good with song titles. Yeah, so. I don't know either. I usually know yeah. like the track number on the <laughs> yeah. record more than I know the song. But there's number. a there's a riff that goes like dum 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 dum. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's not that song. So the awesome Bismi song. I mean, like that's those are the lyrics. He's like awesome. Oh, bitch, me, ass. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, that, yeah, that song is good. Ass. Oh, bitch, me, ass. That's actually not a bad impression of it. That's what it sounds like. Dude, there's a, a really cool Tom G uh, story. It's not my story, tell so it. I don't even know if I should tell it. Tell it. So, Jake Bannon told us this story once. Yeah. And... It's very funny, but essentially Converge played a fest that I can't remember if it was Celtic Frost or Triptychon had played. And <laughs> and Jake was like, hey, man, it's nice to meet you. You know, you have been a large influence on a lot of my music throughout my life. And he responded, I know. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That was it. Dude, that's like, I mean, that's legit. There's a, um, <laughs> there's, there's all kinds of stories of that. Like some guy like being like, yeah, I know, paint me or whatever. Right. <laughs> yeah, like, that's yeah. funny. Um, but obviously the story was like relayed with like the alien Tom G like, I know. Yeah. Like, yeah. So that's funny. I mean, that's cool. I back that. I, I interviewed Tom G, um, probably like, I mean, six or seven years ago at this yeah, point. Yeah. It was I, awesome actually. Like I was, th- I, that was probably the most like geeked out or starstruck I've been with something like that where I'm like holy cow like yeah. this is actually a person who I never thought I would like be anywhere near who is just like my favorite musician and I try yeah. not to be weird but I was definitely <laughs> like oh yeah I mean he's obviously a very influential person for the metal yeah and a lot of probably a lot of punk I would assume yeah for sure you know? I mean Black you know, metal. Yeah. Just, I mean, every, every, everything. Like, it's like proto black metal, proto death metal. I mean, I think that obviously, I think he was very influenced by Discharge and like Battalion of Saints. I think he's, yeah, mentioned. yeah. But I think a lot of D beat bands that came after that were influenced by Celtic Frost as well. So, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, a ton of those like Motorhead ish, like raging rock and roll metal bands are also very derivative of that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's like one of those things where it's like they kind of took all those influences and made it darker and more extreme. So, yeah, which is always cool. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's I mean, it's funny, too, man, because did uh, did you ever read his book that he wrote? I never no, I never. It's, read it. It, well, he so actually speaking of bizarre, like collector behavior, there was a book that I don't know if he wrote or not, but it was uh, it's like out of print. and You can't find it. And there was a copy of it at one of the Chicago public libraries. Uh And I went and I like literally photocopied every page of it. (laughs) And so I like, I had just like 300 (laughs) photocopied pages. It took me like an hour and a half. It probably cost, I don't know, like how more than the book. (laughs) Well, I think the book is very expensive because it's very rare, but it was like, just a totally unreasonable thing to do. But I was like, all right, like I want this. So I went and did that. Um, before eBooks. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) I mean, I don't know. I I guarantee you PDFs existed also, but I mean, whatever, that was just what I decided to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, he also just talks about, you know, sort of like being, uh, young and sort of like primitive and just kind of stumbling into his playing style. Cause he yeah. just kind of like didn't have the skill set to do other stuff and just, that's how he ended up playing. <laughs> yeah. Which it, is very excellent and very cool. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, I mean, I would say in the last six years, Triptychon and Monotheist have been a very large influence on harm's way. So I mean, which is how much, so what about Fear Factory? I mean, Fear Factory, I would say 
a couple of songs on the new record were definitely influenced by Fear Factory. I think Demanufacture is like one of those records that, you know, maybe at the time was like considered new metal to a degree. And when I was like in seventh and eighth grade, Fear Factory is my favorite band. And I actually, at OzFest 98, left Slayer to go watch my favorite <laughs> band, Fear Factory, which like is funny to think about in retrospect. Because like, you know, as a seventh grade kid, seeing Slayer at OzFest, you know, was probably a cool experience, but obviously I'm not going to miss my favorite band. So, but you know, fast forwarding to now, like I look at demanufacture and you realize like how much God flesh influenced them in Dude, a lot the of record ways. before that just sounds like God flesh. Yeah. I mean, essentially yeah. it's and, like death metal. And then there's just like, and a God flesh part. Yeah. And here's a death metal part. Here's a God flesh part. I can't remember. I, I think I read something where he talked about how influential God flesh was on starting fear factory. But I mean, Fear Factory essentially is just a heavy electronic band. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, the drums are very overproduced. And the, <laughs> I guess, the the singing can be a little bit obnoxious to some people. Well, I actually, I, I, I mean, I kind of hate it. But when I filter it through a Godflesh lens, it doesn't bother me as much. Sure. I See, I don't hate it. But that might be because... Like, that's what I always... Well, I mean, it's also... If, if something like that is your favorite band when you're in seventh grade, it's like... Yeah, it's... There's a di there's a different thing to it. Because, I mean, there's, like, some ska stuff that I <laughs> liked as a seventh grader that if I heard now, I'm sure I'd be like, dude, come on, man. But, like... Yeah, but it's, it's kind of, like, a yeah. nostalgic thing. But at the same time, like, there is some really heavy fucking riffs on that record. And they also incorporate some electronic sounds that are really heavy. And so using that aspect from Fear Factory, I think harm's way, you know, I, I don't know. It's hard to say. Cause you know, a lot of people have thrown around the word new metal with our band before. And like, I, I, I don't, I never saw it as, as new metal at all. Hold you know? on though, because on your last record, you had working titles for songs, one of which was <laughs> Slipknot One, and the other of which was Slipknot Two. Sure. However, I definitely saw a piece of paper in the practice space. <laughs> had See, both Slipknot One and Two. On the it. thing is, like, <laughs> I don't know how your bands work. I mean, I know how Hate Force works, but I personally. Like every band I've ever been in, we, before we have working song titles, it just, we list what it sounds like. Yeah. However, Slipknot. So you in your own band are saying that this sounds enough like Slipknot <laughs> to call it Slipknot. And not, we have another I, song that sounds enough like Slipknot and we can't even come up with a different band to rip off. Well, so I, therefore I, well, we have two on, songs time named out, time Slipknot. <laughs> Like, I don't think our band is new metal. However, I think some of the, there was parts that I guess sounded like Slipknot. And sure. if there's a lot of Slipknot parts that if you heard them by themselves would not be considered new metal. So if you look at it from a perspective of, yes, Slipknot is like a new metal band, if you will. However, they do have some heavy parts of course. that I like, you know, they're, 150 song catalog as a whole I'm not a huge fan of but there's probably 10 really good Flipknot songs that I enjoy and at the time I think Harm's Way was trying to because I think people get confused with like oh here's a catchy open string riff you know that like tons of bands in the history of metal have done you know like we talked about Celtic Frost Triptychon you know, obviously they're a newer band, but, and then you have like prong. Yeah, sure. And like, you know, those would be, if those were labeled new metal, then like that, they would still be considered that. But at the same time, it's like, dude, those are pretty fucking heavy riffs. And like we talked about earlier, machine head. Yeah. Like machine head, like definitely like, I don't really like their full catalog at all, but like, dude, they have some really catchy, like open, string parts that like you know i think that especially isolation like that was a huge influence you know even though like it's really hard to get through a full machine head record yeah there's there's a lot of cringe yeah you know and 
for me that comes with like the singing and like weird melodic like uh yeah. <laughs> like like dude like I don't know where this is coming from but but then like there's some really obviously heavy parts and 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 catchy catchy riffs so I don't even know what what we were even talking I mean, about you're, at you're this try, point. You're trying to argue against people referencing new metal, yeah, yeah, relative to harm's way, despite naming your own song Slipknot. I mean, whatever, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I I think I understand what you're saying though. Essentially, that like you have this sort of like groovy single string type of riff that came to popularity with the new metal scene. Yeah. But that just because you have that kind of riff doesn't mean that you're a new metal band. Correct. Right. I mean, it's like, it's almost like, I mean that, that, that type of riff, I mean, you could, you could do a similar parallel with say like a, like a melodic single note, like fast riff that's harmonized in thirds and be like, Oh, that's like an iron maiden riff or like a new wave of British heavy metal riff. Yeah. But right. And then, and, but then that riff gets carried forward. Okay. It's in at the gates. It's in fucking avenge sevenfold. Yeah, whatever. of course. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I guess that's where it comes from. I mean, that's the first band that came to mind. Cause we're like, Oh, this sounds like Slipknot, but like, that's not necessarily like from, from the full spectrum. That's not like what we were going for. Yeah. But it's just like, Oh, this single string part actually does sound like Slipknot, but it's not a completely new metal. Yeah. Cause I mean, it, it doesn't have the, like the like angsty, I'm a psycho vibe. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, there's, there's not like, it, like talking parts where you kind of like, let your voice swell up. Like, it's not like, yeah, I, I mean, obviously new metal has like a certain vibe behind it that makes it what it is. Yeah. You know, whatever weird fucking, you know, baggy clothes, <laughs> fucking eye makeup, <laughs> fucking weird piercings, you know, I, too many straps on your pants, you know, fucking ICP in the, in your CD booklet. Yeah. You know, I mean, great Milenko. Yeah, who I honestly, I mean I, I think I mean people used to call Madball new metal, you know, like 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 the later records. Yeah, sure. Because they had some influence. I mean it's that, it's that same like groovy syncopated riff, right? Sure. That's like, okay, cool, like Biohazard and Madball were doing that also. Yeah, and but Biohazard and Madball are good bands, so Yeah. You know, it's it's and, it's not all bad, if you will, you know. Sure. Hey, this is Todd jumping in here real quick. In a classic case of more gear, more problems, got some new stuff to work on the podcast with, which should make it sound a little bit better. But unfortunately, in that process, I've also encountered a variety of foibles and problems, such as right here. So we're jumping over to the backup track, which is fortunately recording, and you're going to see a slight dip in audio quality, but still some good stuff here, some tales of conflicts at YMCA's. So keep trucking along. So you're doing a powerlifting meet? Yeah. uh, Why? It's a good question. (laughs) Um, You're a touring musician with a broken body. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because, dude, honestly. Dude, are you doing it like right after you get back from like a giant tour? Four week tour, yeah. Great job. I mean, I've been getting um, training from this dude, Jared Skinner, who works with American Barbell Club. Um, Does he write like an individualized program? Yeah. So it like takes into account that you're traveling and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, he can, he can, he can uh, manipulate it to when I'm home, have access to certain equipment. Um, and and what's cool is <laughs> this is actually pretty funny. So I contacted John, who owns American Barbell Club, to get me in contact with Jared to have him write me a plan because I was going to do a powerlifting meet February second. And so he's like, awesome. Here's the first week's uh, meat prep. The second rep that I that I made the, in the first day of the of the meat prep, I uh, tweaked my my back very bad. And I guess for the people who are listening, I I have a herniated disc on L5 S1 that I've probably had for like three years, um, but it's really started to affect my training negatively for probably the past like two two years but uh essentially (laughs) so he basically went from like here's a really aggressive meat prep to all right you're not doing a meat and here's uh recovery workouts for you know two 
to, to three months and I literally it kind of just started getting back um, to where I was when we started that and so I decided like hey I've been training four days a week for like the last three to four months let's see where this could take me from a strength perspective um, I'm not really having like high expectations for any like lifetime PRs or anything like that but I guess I've just started to accept that it's possible that I won't ever be able to reach my goal of deadlifting 700 naturally or squatting 600 naturally if my body is never able to be healthy. Um, and like, I guess the thing that sucks is like, I've done a lot of different things for my, my herniated disc. Um, like chiropractic work didn't help at all. Um, it probably actually made it worse, you know, cause putting trauma to a, a already strongly inflamed area is not a good, smart idea. Um, you know, I, I think one of the best things for it is, you know, static stretching after you lift using the spinal decompressor, if you have one, or, uh, in my, my favorite is the reverse hyperextension. Um, Louis. yeah. However, the problem is, is, you know, I've had to switch my deadlift form to sumo and that's like basically relearning a completely new lift. And so it's almost like starting over in, in, a, in a lot of ways. And, you know, when I was, wasn't hurt, like my sumo was always like 150 pounds less than my conventional deadlift. Sure. And, you know, I've been able to get almost, you know, to where my conventional was, but it's just, I get to a certain point and then my back gets really aggravated no matter what. So even if I maintain a neutral spine or, whatever i'm fortunate though that squatting usually is fine it doesn't put my back in any compromising positions usually but so i mean the meat is basically something that i just want to do it to kind of prove to myself that i can still do a meet regardless of the numbers that i'm going to to get um so i mean it's kind of like okay i have this injury <clears throat> And I don't want this to sort of like define my training. Sure. I mean, and the thing is like, I mean, I'm pretty fortunate as far as herniated discs go. I mean, the way I lifted for a lot of years and I mean, I worked a labor job since I was like nine. And I think honestly, that has a lot to do with why I'm strong and farm also boy, farm boy strong. Yeah. I mean, I mean, dude, it, me and my dad used to have contests of how many 80 pound bags we could carry in a wheelbarrow. And essentially that's like the first time I was like, Oh, like I'm stronger than my dad is I carried 11, <laughs> 80, 80 pound bags around this corner without it dropping. Yeah. And it's funny, but I mean, but at the same time, I think just the years of like impact on lower back and then sitting in a fucking van for like the past 10 years you know my hips are fucking chronically tight yeah and and that makes sense I mean, that, that whole touring lifestyle is just so hard on you in general it's like okay like you're sitting in a spot where you don't have room and you're not sleeping well and your only calories which you're probably not gonna have enough of are just coming from like yeah garbage beef jerky and like soda yeah and, and then you know you know, five or six years ago, I started training on the road. So it's like, in order to recover, you're eating a lot of supplements, which like isn't always the best form of obviously getting recovery. And <laughs> um, I mean, it's just like, I guess I got it. The thing I have to remember is that like, how many people do I know who do what I do at the level that I do are as strong as me? and can can compete at a moderately competitive level. Like I know I'm not the strongest powerlifter on earth. I know there's people who are my weight that are much stronger than me probably, you know, naturally and unnaturally. But like, I guess I it makes me happy that I'm able to maintain like my physique, able to maintain like a relatively high, you know, strength, 
you know, while also being gone six, seven months out of the year. And I, I, I just think, you know, instead of being hard on myself all the time about like, yeah, like it's bullshit that I haven't reached these goals. The last 10 years I've gained 15 pounds on my deadlift. You know, I've gained 20 pounds on my bench. I've gained like, you know, probably a hundred pounds on my squat, but you know, like to think if I would have just not done the band and concentrated on that, like maybe my numbers would have been what they, what I wanted them to be. But I guess like, the next step is either stop or or decide to take steroids. So just take it up a notch. Yeah, I I mean that's really all all there is to it. Because as far as pushing the body, I mean I'm already training pretty hard, you know. But there's just certain things that I can't do, like I used to be able to, which is unfortunate. But it's just the reality. Well, I mean it's trade offs, right? Like yeah. The, in order to devote the the time and energy necessary to recovering from training the yeah. way you would need to if that was your top priority. Like, you would just have to not do the stuff you do. Yeah, of course. I mean, if, if I wanted to be the, the best 198-pound powerlifter in the world, which, like, I don't even know if genetically if that would even be possible for me, but at least be, like, I'm fairly sure I could get to top 25, but it's not going to happen if I'm on the road. No. And it's not going to happen probably ever now since I'm 32. And those times of those peak peak training years are starting to come to an end. But, I mean, there's a lot of strong powerlifters that are strong into their mid-40s, you know. you know. I mean, powerlifting does seem to be a sport that age is not as much of a disadvantage as in other ones. Sure. I think a part of that is, though, is, like, muscle maturity. You know, you start to really retain your your muscle size like it's it's harder to lose i feel when you get a little bit older like as far as like like muscle size and like mass but like obviously (laughs) it's the strength we can lose that pretty fast if you stop you know i think like as far as you know gaining fat unwanted fat i mean that that just gets seems to get worse too but um from a training perspective, I feel like powerlifting is very form based. So it's like, you know, if, if you've done 10,000 repetitions of a lift, like I think like the nerve adaptation and the muscle memory is very important with powerlifting. You know, I mean, Olympic weightlifting it is too, but I feel like it's harder to be competitive for really long in Olympic weightlifting as you get older because, you know, your flexibility starts to decrease and whereas I don't think you need as much flexibility to bench yeah, press sure. or well I mean it's even a benefit to not be flexible exactly yeah I right. mean your stretch like reflex and you can just yeah. sort of rely on of course various tight structures of your body to help you yeah I mean there's dudes who I mean I've seen I mean I went to a USAPL meet was what 2016 and there was a dude who was in his late 40s who uh, was, I mean, and USAPL is a natural organization, so, and he, I think he squatted, like, 744 with just knee sleeves, and he, I think he pulled, like, 7-something, but then he benched, like, 450 or 460, and he almost beat Jesse Norris, which is, you know, the best 198 natural powerlifter um, in the world, and it was because Jesse had like a bum shoulder, so he only could bench like three fifty. But like, like I mean, that just made me think like, fuck, man. Like, powerlifting doesn't have to be over if you don't want it to be, but it just gets a lot harder. I feel. Yeah. Sure. Like I mean, recovering. You know, like you get to a point where your genetic maximums are start to come into play, and if you want to get above those numbers, like. You know, you have to increase volume, you have to increase recovery time, you have to do things above and beyond what you normally used to do. And obviously, being in a band that's going to be gone next year for probably six or seven months, it's like, you know, I don't, I don't know how possible it is for me to achieve, achieve those goals. But Yeah. 
Well, it's it's really interesting to think about like the training mindset in that sure. instance too. Where you know at some point you're training like, okay, I'm gonna see what I can do. I'm gonna see what I'm capable of, and then to continue to train when you sort of might know like I'm never going to hit the numbers that I once hit. Yeah. Right? I mean, I'm in that position. Right. I mean, I had wrist surgery. I overtrain myself pretty badly. I run a gym that consumes my life, right? It's like, of course, okay, yeah. like I'm never going to snatch what I snatched before. I'm never going to clean a jerk when I clean a jerk before. Like my wrist simply won't allow it even if I wanted to. Yeah. So that it's like kind of, it's totally different to, to think about. Training well, I, I think when it comes to training and, and if you want to continue to train, you need to, you need to start to create new goals. Like for example, like for me, like squatting is still a very doable thing without pain and i have been hitting prs for like the last couple of years you know i've i've been gaining more and more strength to my squat whereas before like the deadlift was my favorite lift and i was very good at it and i think if i would have continued to train it without getting hurt you know i think i definitely could get 700 but you know like just kind of shifting gears and being like well I might not deadlift 700 anymore, but maybe I'll get back to 600. And then maybe I'll increase my bench by 30 pounds and bench 360 or 370. And then I'll increase my squat maybe to 580, you know? And, and those, so my goals have shifted instead of like being, okay, I'm just going to deadlift a lot, you know? Okay. I can deadlift moderate weight still. And that will just have to be good enough until, you know, the stem cells, uh, are good enough to exactly. regenerate disc tissue. <laughs> Peter Peter Thiel will figure something out for us. Yeah, I dude, I, I mean, this I think it just came out today, but there was a podcast on Joe Rogan that uh, talked with Mel Gibson and another doctor about um, I, can't, I don't even know what it's called, but it's basically stem cells from the umbilical cord. Mm-hmm. Um, it starts with an M. It's kind of hard to pronounce. Yeah, but. Uh, Basically, there's a lot of studies they were saying they're coming out that how useful it is in like regenerating like cells. And Mel Gibson's father is essentially it's a very funny person to take on. Uh, yeah, I'm sure Mel Gibson is the world's leading authority on yeah. all but, scientific endeavors. But I guess he had worked with this particular doctor and he's and he works out of Panama because Panama is one of the few countries that it's legal to do in. And they talk, I mean, they were talking all the way from like, you know, obviously regenerating shoulders, knees, hips, um, spines to like regenerating heart tissue for people who have like a lot of, you know, inflammation in their heart and talking about regenerating, you know, autoimmune diseases, you know, to people that have like functional lifestyles. I mean, it seems like the science is pretty, pretty awesome behind it. However, I mean, it's hard to say, you know, in a, in a, I guess in a subject matter that is very underfunded and the, you know, the studies that exist are probably not considered super reliable considering they're probably, you know, 20, maybe there's 20, 30 studies yeah. that maybe, you know, whereas like obviously all these pharmaceutical companies are going to be investing in, you know, whatever st- drugs they're trying to sell to, you know, to, to prove that, you know, those things are more beneficial. But I mean, I guess if you could just go and get a few injections of, of cells and it's going to cure, you know, all these problems, you know, then obviously they would be shit out. Yeah. I mean, I mean, if I could afford, if I could afford it, I'd do it right now. Yeah. I mean, I I would literally go down down to Panama with Mel. Absolutely. Hey Mel. I would, yeah, me and Mel would, would talk about the Patriot and Braveheart. Yeah. <laughs> I would disregard all the negative uh, press he's gotten in the past, like, 15 years. <laughs> From his poor, eccentric behavior? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some very strange behavior from Mel Gibson, no doubt. But yeah. I guess if we can nachos can put Mel Gibson on a T-shirt and not get shit for it, then I can hang out with him. Probably. Yeah. I mean, you're already banned from Europe. Yeah, what it's else, true. What else is going to happen? I, absolutely. I mean, yeah, Europe is... I mean, the thing is, is I really dislike Europe, so... Yeah, I mean, back to lifting. It's fucking... It's a long process that 
once you like people always said like once I hit 30 that like things would start to hurt more and I always thought that was kind of bullshit because you know why would why would someone who's in decent shape and works out all the time and like takes care of themselves like why would I have the same pain that like some dope who doesn't do anything sits on their ass all the time but unfortunately it hit me pretty hard like I got started getting a lot of injuries when I was 30 like I have really bad tendonitis in my my bicep so that's why when you mentioned uh butterfly pull-ups it not did a, not not a nah. wise move yeah I mean I I still I still do things I definitely shouldn't do and it definitely aggravates about every injury that I have but <laughs> it's just like it's either stop doing it and get much weaker and smaller and have to accept that or become a beta male yeah yeah i mean yeah maybe maybe that's the next step i think you need to become a submissive beta male (laughs) yeah i i I don't know i i guess the the perceived uh masculine identity is is no longer (laughs) working for me so but i think that would actually be if people you, you should become a beta male and then you should turn harm's way into a band that sounds like the blood brothers <laughs> yeah that that would be really that would be really hard for me to do i mean the blood brothers are a pretty fucking terrible band yeah. i mean i remember i mean going back to what we talked about earlier nick donahue introduced the uh blood brothers to me of course yeah and uh that's a band that like even then when i liked like the worst of like shitty screamo I still like could never get into that fucking shitty ass band. I actually had the same experience where it's like, yeah, I like the Locust, <laughs> but I don't like the Black Locust. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had to, I had to, you know, call, or I guess I had to draw the line at some point. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I was like, yo, fuck this, because that shit, that is some whiny fucking bullshit. Very spastic and whiny, unacceptable. Yeah. So you lift at YMCA's on the road. Yeah, How's that's that? it can be pretty annoying. Um but at the same time the YMCA is very inexpensive when it comes to a gym that you can access, you know, essentially on a national level and even you know, I've gone to YMCA's in Canada as well. I mean basically you know, the, the most most modern YMCA's and a lot of the older YMCA's like you know, like, I guess there's there's ones that we'll go to that have, like, power racks, deadlift platforms with chalk. You know, like, there's dudes who have been working out there since, like, the 70s. Yeah. You know? And then there's, like, gyms where you go to where they only have a Smith machine as far as free weights go. And, like, I've honestly only one time had a problem at a YMTA. And it was with a, another member, actually. What? Why? <laughs> So, like, they had a bunch of free weights and, and squatting. Like, people were squatting and stuff. And, dude, like, we just basically were like, oh, like, we're going to deadlift in this power rack. And, like, we started deadlifting. And, like, this guy from across the gym was like, like, how about you stop banging the weights? And he was, like, talk, he was, like talking shit. And I was like, dude, like, we're deadlifting. Like, we're not banging the weights. Like, we're setting them down. And he's like, yo, this isn't a heavy metal gym. This is a YMCA. And, like, I kind of understand where he's coming from. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. But, like, it's not like we were, like, growling or, like, yelling or, so, like. if you were in a Planet Fitness, would the lung alarm have been sounded on you? I mean, it's possible. But <laughs> the thing is, Chris doesn't control his descent of the bar very well. So he bangs the, the weights pretty hard. Um on the floor but this guy started going into like yo I paid my dues like now we're gonna have to pay more because you guys are ruining the floor of the YMCA and you know keep in mind this is a a rubber floor that's meant to be have weights dropped on it and basically I came over to approach him and he was like you're getting awful close and this is a this is like a 55 year old man or 60 year old man And I was like, dude, what is your fucking problem? Like, not not in the sense that, like, hey, like, 
like, would you want to step outside and like yeah. fight about this? But like, <laughs> like, yeah, we're trying it. This is a gym that obviously has free weights. No one from the staff came up to us to tell us to stop. And then he threatened to knock me out or he said something. If you get any closer, I'm going to put you out. But I don't know. Sounds I don't, like a Walmart potion castle. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it, it pretty much was. But like, I was just very confused because I was like, like literally all the dude had to do was be like, hey, um, you guys are banging the weights a little bit loud. Would you mind getting some mats? Or would you mind, you know, maybe putting it in the rack? But like he immediately became confrontational. And then he also, like when an employee came over, because they obviously saw there was like a confrontation yeah. happening. Like, he was like, yeah, like him and his, his two buddies over there were like, they were about to back him up. Like they were getting really hostile. And I was like, what? Like I literally was addressing you like face to face being like, Hey, like, what do you want us to do so that you're not upset? And then he became very upset. And yeah. And the thing is when he said like, he's like, you're about to be out. Like, I don't know if he meant knocked out or that I was going to get kicked out. Of the YMCA? Yeah. Maybe it was purposefully ambiguous. But, like, I never... I mean, at age 32, it's not like I'm looking to fight anybody at this point. Because it, it's You're just, not looking to fight a 55-year-old YMCA patron? Yeah. I mean, I'm not looking for fights, period, let alone an old man. You know, maybe he was a fucking Green Beret or some shit. I don't... I have no idea, but... Like, we we're also in Arizona, so, I mean, you can fucking carry automatic weapons there, probably, so, <laughs> like, it's not like I really wanted to, but that's, out of any of the times, that was the only problem I ever had in YMCA. Well, and, so did you finish deadlifting? Yes, actually. All right, cool. The staff was like, carry on, sir. The staff was there like, hey, we have these mats that you can use to put the weights down, and I was like, perfect. Like, literally, a, a reasonable solution to a loud a loud noise in a in a ymca i mean keep in mind this is a ymca that looked like a lifetime fitness like probably the, one of the nicer ymcas i've ever been to and like people were lifting weights like normally like like what so you can't deadlift in a gym but there is like straight up ymcas that literally are made for old people that go and you know try to get you know whatever you know, small amount of exercise every day. So I understand. So I, if I am deadlifting or trying to do anything too crazy, I just go and pay for a, a powerlifting gym. And I try to try to support some of the individual gyms around the country if I can. But yeah, I mean, YMCA is just so easy and they honor your membership everywhere. And that's, that's hard to find, honestly. Yeah, like for sure. Well, and they are actually like almost everywhere. Yeah, I mean, like if you want a golds like national membership, and there's not even a golds in every state, it's like a hundred and twenty dollars a month or something like astronomical. Yeah. The YMCA, I think, me and Chris pay forty a month, and we can go to any single one in the whole country. So. There you go. That's the, yeah, that's that's, the, that's how you solve the I can't work out on tour. Get a YMCA. The Young Men's Christian Association. Yeah, support a a center that's very involved in the community. Perfect. (laughs) All right, James, let's wrap this up, man. All right. Been going for a while. We have. So what's the deal with the new record? When is it out? Uh, So Post Human's out February 9th. Um, We should have a music video out before then. Um, I'm not sure the exact date, but... Is it artistic? um, We actually haven't filmed it yet, so I don't don't entirely know. I know we are running out of time, but yeah. we're filming it the 31st of January. Yeah. So, and then yeah, the new record will be out, and then we're going on tour with uh, Ringworm Vane in Queens Way on February 17th, which would be basically a full U.S. Um, aside from the Northwest, which we probably get called out for not ever going there because it's a fucking pain to go there, but. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's basically it. We're excited for the new record. Excited to tour. Hopefully, you know, we have like another three or four more tours before uh, 2018's over. Do you have any of them booked? Can you announce them? I can't. I can't book or I can't announce any particular uh, tour aside from the one 
we are, we are playing uh, Mexico. I can say that much. Yeah. Which, but, you know, obviously, if you live in Mexico, that's a... That affects you, yeah. And our Mexico listenership is through the roof. <laughs> I assumed it was, yeah. so. But, uh, yeah, hopefully, I mean, I think we're going to try and go to Europe in, like, May. We're still working on that right now. Then we're going to do a summer tour. Um, and then we'll see what other opportunities come up after the record is out, so. Great. I think it's really good, so. I appreciate it's it. It's usually not an indicator of anything other than itself, but <laughs> I feel that people will enjoy it. Yeah, hopefully they do, and hopefully they listen to this three-hour podcast. <laughs> One and a half. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Hey, this is Todd again, and as most of you know, I consume, read, listen to, watch an absurd amount of content on a regular basis, and a few times per month, I send out my thoughts on some of the most interesting or insightful stuff that I've taken a look at. You can be on the list to receive this fascinating, captivating, and delightful information at toddneef.com. That's I before E. Head over there, go ahead and type your email address in, and then as I send these things out, again, a few times a month, you'll get it and you'll be inundated with a carefully curated list of the best stuff that I am experiencing.